Chapter 13. Why do we fall ill? Activity 13.1. We have all heard of the earthquakes in Latour, Bouj, Kashmir, etc. Or the cyclones that lash the coastal regions. Think of as many different ways as possible in which people's health would be affected by such a disaster if it took place in our neighborhood. How many of these ways we can think of are events that would occur when the disaster is actually happening? How many of these health-related events would happen long after the actual disaster but would still be because of the disaster? Why would one effect on health fall into the first group and why would another fall into the second group? When we do this exercise, we realize that health and disease in human communities are very complex issues with many interconnected causes. We also realize that the ideas of what health and disease mean are themselves very complicated. When we ask what causes diseases and how we prevent them, we have to begin by asking what these notions mean. We have seen that cells are the basic units of organisms. Cells are made of a variety of chemical substances, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, or lipids, and so on. Cell is a dynamic place. Something or the other is always happening inside them. Complex reactions and repair goes on inside cells. New cells are being made. In our organs or tissues, there are various specialized activities going on. The heart is beating, the lungs are breathing, the kidney is filtering urine, the brain is thinking. All these activities are interconnected. For example, if the kidneys are not filtering urine, poisonous substances will accumulate. Under such conditions, the brain will not be able to think properly. For all these interconnected activities, energy and raw material are needed. Food is a necessity for cell and tissue functions. Anything that prevents proper functioning of cells and tissues will lead to a lack of proper activity of the body. It is in this context that we will look at the notions of health and disease. 13.1 Health and its failure. 13.1.1 The significance of health. We have heard the word health used quite frequently. We use it ourselves as well when we say things like, My grandmother's health is not good. Our teachers use it when they scold us, saying, This is not a healthy attitude. What does the word health mean? If we think about it, we realize that it always implies the idea of being well. We can think of this well being as effective functioning. For our grandmothers, being able to go out to the market or to visit neighbors is being well, and not being able to do such things is poor health. Being interested in following the teaching in the classroom so that we can understand the world is called a healthy attitude, while not being interested is called the opposite. Health is therefore a state of being well enough to function well physically, mentally, and socially. 13.1.2 Personal and community issues both matter for health. If health means a state of physical, mental, and social well being, it cannot be something that each one of us can achieve entirely on our own. The health of all organisms will depend on their surroundings or their environment. The environment includes the physical environment. So, for example, health is at risk in a cyclone in many ways. Human beings live in societies. Our social environment, therefore, is an important factor in our individual health. We live in villages, towns, or cities. In such places, even our physical environment is decided by our social environment. Consider what would happen if no agency is ensuring that garbage is collected and disposed. What would happen if no one takes responsibility for clearing the drains and ensuring that water does not collect in the streets or open spaces? So, if there is a great deal of garbage thrown in our streets, or if there is open drain water lying stagnant around where we live, the possibility of poor health increases. Therefore, public cleanliness is important for individual health. Activity 13.2. Find out what provisions are made by your local authority, panchayat, municipal corporation, for the supply of clean drinking water. Are all the people in your locality able to access this? Activity 13.3. Find out how your local authority manages the solid waste generated in your neighborhood. Are these measures adequate? If not, what improvements would you suggest? What could your family do to reduce the amount of solid waste generated during a day per week? We need food to be healthy, and this food will have to be earned by doing work. For this, the opportunity to do work has to be available. We need to be happy in order to be truly healthy, and if we mistreat each other and are afraid of each other, we cannot be happy or healthy. Social equality and harmony are therefore necessary for individual health. We can think of many other such examples of connections between community issues and individual health. 13.1.3 Distinctions between healthy and disease free. If this is what we mean by health, what do we mean by disease? The word is actually self explanatory, we can think of it as disease, disturbed ease. Disease, in other words, literally means being uncomfortable. However, the word is used in a more limited meaning. We talk of disease when we can find a specific and particular cause for discomfort. This does not mean that we have to know the absolute final cause. We can say that someone is suffering from diarrhea without knowing exactly what has caused the loose motions. We can now easily see that it is possible to be in poor health without actually suffering from a particular disease. Simply not being diseased is not the same as being healthy. Good health for a dancer may mean being able to stretch his body into difficult but graceful positions. On the other hand, good health for a musician may mean having enough breathing capacity in his her lungs to control the notes from his her flute. To have the opportunity to realize the unique potential in all of us is also necessary for real health. So, we can be in poor health without there being a simple cause in the form of an identifiable disease. This is the reason why, when we think about health, we think about societies and communities. On the other hand, when we think about disease, we think about individual sufferers. Questions. 1. State any two conditions essential for good health. 2. State any two conditions essential for being free of disease. 3. Are the answers to the above questions necessarily the same or different? Why? 13.2 Disease and its causes. 13.2.1 What does disease look like? Let us now think a little more about diseases. In the first place, how do we know that there is a disease? In other words, how do we know that there is something wrong with the body? There are many tissues in the body, as we have seen in Chapter 6. These tissues make up physiological systems or organ systems that carry out body functions. Each of the organ systems has specific organs as its parts, and it has particular functions. So, the digestive system has the stomach and intestines, and it helps to digest food taken in from outside the body. The musculoskeletal system, which is made up of bones and muscles, holds the body parts together and helps the body move. When there is a disease, either the functioning of one or more systems of the body will change for the worse. These changes give rise to symptoms and signs of disease. Symptoms of disease are the things we feel as being wrong. So we have a headache, we have cough, we have loose motions, we have a wound with pus, these are all symptoms. These indicate that there may be a disease, but they don't indicate what the disease is. For example, a headache may mean just examination stress, or very rarely, it may mean meningitis, or any one of a dozen different diseases. Signs of disease are what physicians will look for on the basis of the symptoms. Signs will give a little more definite indication of the presence of a particular disease. Physicians will also get laboratory tests done to pinpoint the disease further. 13.2.2 Acute and chronic diseases. The manifestations of disease will be different depending on a number of factors. Some diseases last for only very short periods of time, and these are called acute diseases. We all know from experience that the common cold lasts only a few days. Other ailments can last for a long time, even as much as a lifetime, and are called chronic diseases. An example is the infection causing elephantiasis, which is very common in some parts of India. Activity 13.4. Survey your neighborhood to find out. 1. How many people suffered from acute diseases during the last three months? 2. How many people developed chronic diseases during the same period? 3. And finally, the total number of people suffering from chronic diseases in your neighborhood. Are the answers to questions 1 and 2 different? Are the answers to questions 2 and 3 different? What do you think could be the reason for these differences? What do you think would be the effect of these differences on the general health of the population? 13.2.3 Chronic diseases and poor health. Acute and chronic diseases have different effects on our health. Any disease that causes poor functioning of some part of the body will affect our health. This is because all functions of the body are necessary for being healthy. But an acute disease, which is over very soon, will not have time to cause major effects on general health, while a chronic disease will do so. As an example, think about a cough and cold, which all of us have from time to time. Most of us get better and become well within a week or so. And there are no lasting effects on our health. But if we get infected with a chronic disease such as tuberculosis of the lungs, then being ill over the years does make us lose weight and feel tired all the time. 
We may not go to school for a few days if we have an acute disease. But a chronic disease will make it difficult for us to follow what is being taught in school and reduce our ability to learn. In other words, we are likely to have prolonged general poor health if we have a chronic disease. Chronic diseases, therefore, have very drastic long-term effects on people's health as compared to acute diseases. 13.2.4 Causes of Diseases What causes disease? When we think about causes of diseases, we must remember that there are many levels of such causes. Let us look at an example. If there is a baby suffering from loose motions, we can say that the cause of the loose motions is probably an infection. But the next question is where did the infection come from? Suppose we find that the infection came through unclean drinking water. But many babies must have had this unclean drinking water. So, why is it that one baby developed loose motions when the other babies did not? One reason might be that this baby is not healthy. As a result, it might be more likely to have disease when exposed to risk, whereas healthier babies would not. Why is the baby not healthy? Perhaps because it is not well nourished and does not get enough food. So, lack of good nourishment becomes a second cause of the disease. Further, why is the baby not well nourished? Perhaps because it is from a household which is poor. It is also possible that the baby has some genetic difference that makes it more likely to suffer from loose motions when exposed to a pathogen. Without the pathogen, the genetic difference or the poor nourishment alone would not lead to loose motions. But they do become contributory causes of the disease. Why was there no clean drinking water for the baby? Perhaps because the public services are poor where the baby's family lives. So, poverty or lack of public services become third cause of the baby's disease. It will now be obvious that all diseases will have immediate causes and contributory causes. Also, most diseases will have many causes rather than one single cause. 13.2.5 Infectious and Non-Infectious Causes As we have seen, it is important to keep public health and community health factors in mind when we think about causes of diseases. We can take that approach a little further. It is useful to think of the immediate causes of diseases belonging to two distinct types. One group of causes is the infectious agents, mostly microbes or microorganisms. Diseases where microbes are the immediate causes are called infectious diseases. This is because the microbes can spread in the community and the diseases they cause will spread with them. Things to ponder. 1. Do all diseases spread to people coming in contact with a sick person? 2. What are the diseases that are not spreading? 3. How would a person develop those diseases that don't spread by contact with a sick person? On the other hand, there are also diseases that are not caused by infectious agents. The causes vary, but they are not external causes like microbes that can spread in the community. Instead, these are mostly internal, non-infectious causes. For example, some cancers are caused by genetic abnormalities. High blood pressure can be caused by excessive weight and lack of exercise. You can think of many other diseases where the immediate causes will not be infectious. Pepticulses and the Nobel Prize. For many years, everybody used to think that pepticulses, which cause acidity-related pain and bleeding in the stomach and duodenum, were because of lifestyle reasons. Everybody thought that a stressful life led to a lot of acid secretion in the stomach and eventually caused pepticulses. Then two Australians made a discovery that a bacterium, Helicobacter pylori, was responsible for pepticulses. Robin Warren, born 1937, a pathologist from Perth, Australia, saw these small curved bacteria in the lower part of the stomach in many patients. He noticed that signs of inflammation were always present around these bacteria. Barry Marshall, born 1951, a young clinical fellow, became interested in Warren's findings and succeeded in cultivating the bacteria from these sources. In treatment studies, Marshall and Warren showed that patients could be cured of pepticulcer only when the bacteria were killed off from the stomach. Thanks to this pioneering discovery by Marshall and Warren, pepticulcer disease is no longer a chronic, frequently disabling condition, but a disease that can be cured by a short period of treatment with antibiotics. For this achievement, Marshall and Warren, seen in the picture, received the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 2005. The ways in which diseases spread and the ways in which they can be treated and prevented at the community level would be different for different diseases. This would depend a lot on whether the immediate causes are infectious or non-infectious. Questions. 1. List any three reasons why you would think that you are sick and ought to see a doctor. If only one of these symptoms were present, would you still go to the doctor? Why or why not? 2. In which of the following case do you think the long-term effects on your health are likely to be most unpleasant? If you get jaundice. If you get lice. If you get acne. Why? 13.3 Infectious diseases. 13.3.1 Infectious agents. We have seen that the entire diversity seen in the living world can be classified into a few groups. This classification is based on common characteristics between different organisms. Organisms that can cause disease are found in a wide range of such categories of classification. Some of them are viruses, some are bacteria, some are fungi, some are single-celled animals or protozoans. Figure 13.1. Some diseases are also caused by multicellular organisms, such as worms of different kinds. Figure 13.1, a picture of SARS viruses coming out, see arrows, for example, at the surface of an infected cell. The white scale line represents 500 nanometers, which is half a micrometer, which is one thousandth of a millimeter. The scale line gives us an idea of how small the things we are looking at are. Courtesy, Emerging Infectious Diseases, a journal of CDC, US. Figure 13.1b, picture of Staphylococci, the bacteria which can cause acne. The scale of the image is indicated by the line at top left, which is 5 micrometers long. Figure 13.1c, picture of trypanosoma, the protozoan organism responsible for sleeping sickness. The organism is lying next to a saucer-shaped red blood cell to give an idea of the scale. Copyright, Oregon Health and Science University, US. Figure 13.1d, picture of Leishmania, the protozoan organism that causes color as R. The organisms are oval-shaped, and each has one long whip-like structure. One organism, arrow, is dividing, while a cell of the immune system, lower right, has gripped on the two whips of the dividing organism and is sending cell processes up to eat up the organism. The immune cell is about 10 micrometers in diameter. Figure 13.1b, picture of an adult roundworm, Ascaris lumbricoids from the small intestine. The ruler next to it shows 4 centimeters to give us an idea of the scale. Common examples of diseases caused by viruses are the common cold, influenza, dengue fever, and AIDS. Diseases like typhoid fever, cholera, tuberculosis, and anthrax are caused by bacteria. Many common skin infections are caused by different kinds of fungi. Protozoan microbes cause many familiar diseases such as malaria and cholera. Are. All of us have also come across intestinal worm infections as well as diseases like elephantiasis caused by different species of worms. Why is it important that we think of these categories of infectious agents? The answer is that these categories are important factors in deciding what kind of treatment to use. Members of each one of these groups, viruses, bacteria, and so on, have many biological characteristics in common. All viruses, for example, live inside host cells, whereas bacteria very rarely do. Viruses, bacteria, and fungi multiply very quickly, while worms multiply very slowly in comparison. Taxonomically, all bacteria are closely related to each other than to viruses and vice versa. This means that many important life processes are similar in the bacteria group but are not shared with the virus group. As a result, drugs that block one of these life processes in one member of the group is likely to be effective against many other members of the group. But the same drug will not work against a microbe belonging to a different group. As an example, let us take antibiotics. They commonly block biochemical pathways important for bacteria. Many bacteria, for example, make a cell wall to protect themselves. The antibiotic penicillin blocks the bacterial processes that build the cell wall. As a result, the growing bacteria become unable to make cell walls and die easily. Human cells don't make a cell wall anyway, so penicillin cannot have such an effect on us. Penicillin will have this effect on any bacteria that use such processes for making cell walls. Similarly, many antibiotics work against many species of bacteria rather than simply working against one. But viruses do not use these pathways at all, and that is the reason why antibiotics do not work against viral infections. If we have a common cold, taking antibiotics does not reduce the severity or the duration of the disease. However, if we also get a bacterial infection along with the viral cold, taking antibiotics will help.
How many of you took antibiotics? Ask your parents if you had antibiotics. How long were those who took antibiotics ill? How long were those who didn't take antibiotics ill? Is there a difference between these two groups? If yes, why? If not, why not? 13.3.2 means of spread. How do infectious diseases spread? Many microbial agents can commonly move from an affected person to someone else in a variety of ways. In other words, they can be communicated and so are also called communicable diseases. Such disease causing microbes can spread through the air. This occurs through the little droplets thrown out by an infected person who sneezes or coughs. Someone standing close by can breathe in these droplets and the microbes get a chance to start a new infection. Examples of such diseases spread through the air are the common cold pneumonia and tuberculosis. We all have had the experience of sitting near someone suffering from a cold and catching it ourselves. Obviously, the more crowded our living conditions are, the more likely it is that such airborne diseases will spread. Diseases can also be spread through water. This occurs if the excreta from someone suffering from an infectious gut disease, such as cholera, get mixed with the drinking water used by people living nearby. The cholera causing microbes will enter a healthy person through the water they drink and cause disease in them. Such diseases are much more likely to spread in the absence of safe supplies of drinking water. The sexual act is one of the closest physical contact two people can have with each other. Not surprisingly, there are microbial infections such as syphilis or AIDS that are transmitted by sexual contact from one partner to the other. However, such sexually transmitted diseases are not spread by casual physical contact. Casual physical contacts include handshakes or hugs or sports, like wrestling, or by any of the other ways in which we touch each other socially. Other than the sexual contact, the virus causing AIDS, HIV, can also spread through blood to blood contact with infected people or from an infected mother to her baby during pregnancy or through breastfeeding. We live in an environment that is full of many other creatures apart from us. It is inevitable that many diseases will be transmitted by other animals. These animals carry the infecting agents from a sick person to another potential host. These animals are thus the intermediaries and are called vectors. The commonest vectors we all know are mosquitoes. In many species of mosquitoes, the females need highly nutritious food in the form of blood in order to be able to lay mature eggs. Mosquitoes feed on many warm-blooded animals, including us. In this way, they can transfer diseases from person to person. Fig. 13.2. Figure 13.2. Common methods of transmission of diseases. 13.3.3. Organ specific and tissue specific manifestations. The disease causing microbes enter the body through these different means. Where do they go then? The body is very large when compared to the microbes. So there are many possible places, organs or tissues, where they could go. Do all microbes go to the same tissue or organ, or do they go to different ones? Different species of microbes seem to have evolved to home in on different parts of the body. In part, this selection is connected to the point of entry. If they enter from the air via the nose, they are likely to go to the lungs. This is seen in the bacteria causing tuberculosis. If they enter through the mouth, they can stay in the gut lining like typhoid causing bacteria. Or they can go to the liver, like the viruses that cause jaundice. But this needn't always be the case. An infection like HIV that comes into the body via the sexual organs will spread to lymph nodes all over the body. Malaria causing microbes entering through a mosquito bite will go to the liver and then to the red blood cells. The virus causing Japanese encephalitis or brain fever will similarly enter through a mosquito bite. But it goes on to infect the brain. The signs and symptoms of a disease will thus depend on the tissue or organ which the microbe targets. If the lungs are the targets, then symptoms will be cough and breathlessness. If the liver is targeted, there will be jaundice. If the brain is the target, we will observe headaches, vomiting, fits, or unconsciousness. We can imagine what the symptoms and signs of an infection will be if we know what the target tissue or organ is and the functions that are carried out by this tissue or organ. In addition to these tissue specific effects of infectious disease, there will be other common effects too. Most of these common effects depend on the fact that the body's immune system is activated in response to infection. An active immune system recruits many cells to the affected tissue to kill off the disease causing microbes. This recruitment process is called inflammation. As a part of this process, there are local effects such as swelling and pain, and general effects such as fever. In some cases, the tissue specificity of the infection leads to very general seeming effects. For example, in HIV infection, the virus goes to the immune system and damages its function. Thus, many of the effects of HIV AIDS are because the body can no longer fight off the many minor infections that we face every day. Instead, every small cold can become pneumonia. Similarly, a minor gut infection can produce major diarrhea with blood loss. Ultimately, it is these other infections that kill people suffering from HIV AIDS. It is also important to remember that the severity of disease manifestations depend on the number of microbes in the body. If the number of microbes is very small, the disease manifestations may be minor or unnoticed. But if the number is of the same microbe large, the disease can be severe enough to be life-threatening. The immune system is a major factor that determines the number of microbes surviving in the body. We shall look into this aspect a little later in the chapter. 13.3.4 Principles of Treatment. What are the steps taken by your family when you fall sick? Have you ever thought why you sometimes feel better if you sleep for some time? When does the treatment involve medicines? Based on what we have learned so far, it would appear that there are two ways to treat an infectious disease. One would be to reduce the effects of the disease and the other to kill the cause of the disease. For the first, we can provide treatment that will reduce the symptoms. The symptoms are usually because of inflammation. For example, we can take medicines that bring down fever, reduce pain, or lose motions. We can take bed rest so that we can conserve our energy. This will enable us to have more of it available to focus on healing. But this kind of symptom directed treatment by itself will not make the infecting microbe go away and the disease will not be cured. For that, we need to be able to kill off the microbes. How do we kill microbes? One way is to use medicines that kill microbes. We have seen earlier that microbes can be classified into different categories. They are viruses, bacteria, fungi, or protozoa. Each of these groups of organisms will have some essential biochemical life process which is peculiar to that group and not shared with the other groups. These processes may be pathways for the synthesis of new substances or respiration. These pathways will not be used by us either. For example, our cells may make new substances by a mechanism different from that used by bacteria. We have to find a drug that blocks the bacterial synthesis pathway without affecting our own. This is what is achieved by the antibiotics that we are all familiar with. Similarly, there are drugs that kill protozoa such as the malarial parasite. One reason why making antiviral medicines is harder than making antibacterial medicines is that viruses have few biochemical mechanisms of their own. They enter our cells and use our machinery for their life processes. This means that there are relatively few virus-specific targets to aim at. Despite this limitation, there are now effective antiviral drugs, for example, the drugs that keep HIV infection under control. 13.3.5 Principles of Prevention All of what we have talked about so far deals with how to get rid of an infection in someone who has a disease. But there are three limitations of this approach to dealing with infectious disease. The first is that once someone has a disease, the body functions are damaged and may never recover completely. The second is that treatment will take time, which means that someone suffering from a disease is likely to be better than for some time even if we can get proper treatment. The third is that the person suffering from an infectious disease can serve as the source from where the infection may spread to other people. This leads to the multiplication of the above difficulties. It is because of such reasons that prevention of diseases is better than the cure. How can we prevent diseases? There are two ways, one general and one specific to each disease. The general ways of preventing infections mostly relate to preventing exposure. How can we prevent exposure to infectious microbes? If we look at the means of the spreading, we can get some easy answers. For airborne microbes, we can prevent exposure by providing living conditions that are not overcrowded. For waterborne microbes, we can prevent exposure by providing safe drinking water. This can be done by treating the water to kill any microbial contamination. For vector-borne infections, we can provide clean environments. This would not, for example, allow mosquito breeding. In other words, public hygiene is one basic key to the prevention of infectious diseases. In
a cold and cough in the class, it is likely that the children sitting around will be exposed to the infection. But all of them do not actually suffer from the disease. Why not? This is because the immune system of our body is normally fighting off microbes. We have cells that specialize in killing infecting microbes. These cells go into action each time infecting microbes enter the body. If they are successful, we do not actually come down with any disease. The immune cells manage to kill off the infection long before it assumes major proportions. As we noted earlier, if the number of the infecting microbes is controlled, the manifestations of disease will be minor. In other words, becoming exposed to or infected with an infectious microbe does not necessarily mean developing noticeable disease. So, one way of looking at severe infectious diseases is that it represents a lack of success of the immune system. The functioning of the immune system, like any other system in our body, will not be good if proper and sufficient nourishment and food is not available. Therefore, the second basic principle of prevention of infectious disease is the availability of proper and sufficient food for everyone. Activity 13.6. Conduct a survey in your locality. Talk to 10 families who are well off and 10 who are very poor, in your estimation. Both sets of families should have children who are below 5 years of age. Measure the heights of these children. Draw a graph of the height of each child against its age for both sets of families. Is there a difference between the groups? If yes, why? If there is no difference, do you think that your findings mean that being well off or poor does not matter for health? These are the general ways of preventing infections. What are the specific ways? They relate to a peculiar property of the immune system that usually fights off microbial infections. Let us cite an example to try and understand this property. These days, there is no smallpox anywhere in the world. But as recently as 100 years ago, smallpox epidemics were not at all uncommon. In such an epidemic, people used to be very afraid of coming near someone suffering from the disease since they were afraid of catching the disease. However, there was one group of people who did not have this fear. These people would provide nursing care for the victims of smallpox. This was a group of people who had had smallpox earlier and survived it, although with a lot of scarring. In other words, if you had smallpox once, there was no chance of suffering from it again. So, having the disease once was a means of preventing subsequent attacks of the same disease. This happens because when the immune system first sees an infectious microbe, it responds against it and then remembers it specifically. So the next time the particular microbe or its close relatives enter the body, the immune system responds with even greater vigor. This eliminates the infection even more quickly than the first time around. This is the basis of the principle of immunization. Immunization. Traditional Indian and Chinese medicinal systems sometimes deliberately rub the skin crusts from smallpox victims into the skin of healthy people. They thus hope to induce a mild form of smallpox that would create resistance against the disease. Famously, two centuries ago, an English physician named Edward Jenner realized that milkmaids who had had cowpox did not catch smallpox even during epidemics. Cowpox is a very mild disease. Jenner tried deliberately giving cowpox to people, as he can be seen doing in the picture, and found that they were now resistant to smallpox. This was because the smallpox virus is closely related to the cowpox virus. Cow is bacca in Latin, and cowpox is bacchinia. From these roots, the word vaccination has come into our usage. We can now see that, as a general principle, we can fool the immune system into developing a memory for a particular infection by putting something that mimics the microbe we want to vaccinate against into the body. This does not actually cause the disease, but this would prevent any subsequent exposure to the infecting microbe from turning into actual disease. Many such vaccines are now available for preventing a whole range of infectious diseases and provide a disease-specific means of prevention. There are vaccines against tetanus, diphtheria, whooping cough, measles, polio, and many others. These form the public health program of childhood immunization for preventing infectious diseases. Of course, such a program can be useful only if such health measures are available to all children. Can you think of reasons why this should be so? Some hepatitis viruses, which cause jaundice, are transmitted through water. There is a vaccine for one of them, hepatitis A, in the market. But the majority of children in many parts of India are already immune to hepatitis A by the time they are five years old. This is because they are exposed to the virus through water. Under these circumstances, would you take the vaccine? Activity 13.7. Rabies virus is spread by the bite of infected dogs and other animals. There are anti-rabies vaccines for both humans and animals. Find out the plan of your local authority for the control of rabies in your neighborhood. Are these measures adequate? If not, what improvements would you suggest? Questions. 1. Why are we normally advised to take bland and nourishing food when we are sick? 2. What are the different means by which infectious diseases are spread? 3. What precautions can you take in your school to reduce the incidence of infectious diseases? 4. What is immunization? 5. What are the immunization programs available at the nearest health center in your locality? Which of these diseases are the major health problems in your area? What do you have learned? Health is a state of physical, mental, and social well being. The health of an individual is dependent on his, her physical surroundings and his, her economic status. Diseases are classified as acute or chronic depending on their duration. Disease may be due to infectious or non infectious causes. Infectious agents belong to different categories of organisms and may be unicellular and microscopic or multicellular. The category to which a disease causing organism belongs decides the type of treatment. Infectious agents are spread through air, water, physical contact, or vectors. Prevention of disease is more desirable than its successful treatment. Infectious diseases can be prevented by public health hygiene measures that reduce exposure to infectious agents. Infectious diseases can also be prevented by using immunization. Effective prevention of infectious diseases in the community requires that everyone should have access to public hygiene and immunization. Exercises. 1. How many times did you fall ill in the last one year? What were the illnesses? A think of one change you can make in your habits in order to avoid any of most of the above illnesses. B. Think of one change you would wish for in your surroundings in order to avoid any of most of the above illnesses. 2. A doctor, nurse, health worker is exposed to more sick people than others in the community. Find out how she, he avoids getting sick herself, himself. 3. Conduct a survey in your neighborhood to find out what the three most common diseases are. Suggest three steps that can be taken by your local authorities to bring down the incidence of these diseases. 4. A baby is not able to tell her, his caretakers that she, he is sick. What would help us to find out? But that the baby is sick. B. What is the sickness? 5. Under which of the following conditions is a person most likely to fall sick? A. When she is recovering from malaria. B. When she has recovered from malaria and is taking care of someone suffering from chickenpox. C. When she is on a four day fast after recovering from malaria and is taking care of someone suffering from chickenpox. Why? 6. Under which of the following conditions are you most likely to fall sick? A. When you are taking examinations. B. When you have traveled by bus and train for two days. C. When your friend is suffering from measles. Why? Table of contents. Chapter 13. Why do we fall ill? 13.1 Health and its failure. 13.1.1 The significance of health. 13.1.2 Personal and community issues both matter for health. 13.1.3 Distinctions between healthy and disease free. Questions. 13.2 Disease and its causes. 13.2.1 What does disease look like? 13.2.2 Acute and chronic diseases. 13.2.3 Chronic diseases and poor health. 13.2.4 Causes of diseases. 13.2.5 Infectious and non infectious causes. Questions. 13.3 Infectious diseases. 13.3.1 Infectious agents. 13.3.2 Means of spread. 13.3.3 Organ specific and tissue specific manifestations. 13.3.4 Principles of treatment. 13.3.5 Principles of prevention. Questions. What you have learned. Exercises. Landmarks. Cover. 